Hey everyone, today's episode is with Dr. Jack Cruz. He's a respected neurosurgeon and CEO of Cruz Longevity Center at Destin. It's a health and wellness company dedicated to helping patients avoid the healthcare burdens we typically encounter as we age. He's a member of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, um, the Congress of Neurologic Surgeons and Age Management, Management Medicine Group. So, ooh, okay, so this episode um, might be the most controversial episode I ever draw, but I feel strongly if you guys follow me on social media, if you follow me on Instagram specifically, um, then, you know, my thoughts, uh, in regards to, um, vaccine mandates and we get into that on this episode and Dr. Cruz, you know, he's been in this world for over 30 years. You know, he definitely went the standard, uh, Western medicine route, went to medical school became a surgeon. Um, and he exited from all of that. Um, and he's going to talk about why he's going to talk about the insides of, of the medical industry. Again, we're not poo-pooing Western medicine doctors. We're grateful for the acute emergency medicine and things like that. Um, but he's talking about the problem, you know, he's talking about, in my, in my opinion, the problem and in his opinion, the problem and I know many of my, um, people on social media feel the same way that follow me on Instagram. And it's, it's just that there's, it's, it's more multifaceted than just, you know, (laughs) simply, um, everybody wanting to help. There's a lot of, um, uh, money involved and there's education issues within the medical industry. Um, and he's talking about all that. And what's interesting about Dr. Cruz is that he also, um, is really big on cryptocurrency and decentralization. And he's talking about centralization and decentralization. He's par- paralleling it to our bodies and nature. And it's just, it's such an interesting episode. Um, now, wherever you stand on this issue, um, I think it's, it's definitely going, regardless of where you stand, it's going to give you some interesting food for thoughts. I'll put it that way. And then we talk about all sorts of things. We talk about, um, one of my most favorite parts of the episode is when he talks about vitamin D and, um, why he believes it is, well, he, why he shares it is more optimal to get vitamin D from sun light than a pill form. That was really, really interesting. So anyway, we get into all sorts of things. It's a super um, intellectual and amazing episode. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Here is Dr. Jack Cruz. Okay. So Dr. Cruz, we talked about, um, before the show, we talked a little bit about cryptocurrency decentralization of, um, basically the way the medical system is set up right now. I know for me, um, I get, I, the, I usually, uh, the analogy I give it, and I've done this at doctor's offices, cause I can be a little smart aleck sometimes, but I'm like, how come you can't tell me how much this costs? Oh, cause this system is set up like me going shopping at the grocery store and just putting everything in my cart. And later you're going to send me a bill. And I'm going to find out that these band-aids were actually $70 and I wouldn't have gotten them if I knew they were $70 and, you know, from, from massage therapists to chiropractors to, you know, doctors that I know they're like, we actually literally like can't fix people as fast as we'd like to. We have to go through this process because of the insurance companies, you know? And so I've seen all these problems, obviously a lot of us know about it, but can you enlighten us about, um, what you're doing right now, or, you know, what's, what's possible in terms of a better way for us to experience healthcare? Yeah. So I think the, to, to get into this topic, you need to understand first and define something. What is decentralized yeah. uh, networks? Decentralized networks, the, the one that's the most common that I think everybody has um, an experience with is nature. Mm-hmm. Nature means that there's nobody between you and nature in between. Yeah. Now, most people uh, understand uh, centralized processes. You have central bankers, you have um, for example, a hospital, a hospital gets between you and your doctor in terms of treatment. Right. Uh, the other big thing in centralized medicine is big pharma. Why? Because who's in between you and the doctor is actually the prescription pad and what can and can't be done. Mm-hmm. And most people understand this by having a middleman. And if you understand decentralized networks in nature, I'll give you an example to really hammer this home. In Japan, they tried to build a new subway tunnel a long time ago. And they asked a bunch of engineers how to make this the most energy efficient process so they could get this thing built. And believe it or not, they took a uh, green slime uh, and laid it down in the sewer system in wow. Japan. And the green slime grew <laughs> and that uh, growth mapped out actually where they were gonna put the subway tunnels. In other words, it wasn't based on 
man-made ideas from engineering. They decided wow. to let biology dictate how it goes. Why? Because everything in biology tends to be what we call quantum thermodynamically efficient. And it turns out one of the key features of all decentralized network, um, which is nature, is that it's the most energy efficient. So if you know anything about the newer sciences out there, specifically quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, energy and information are, ha are handled the same way. Uh, they're considered the same thing. Mm -hmm. So anytime you want to stay efficient, you continue to use decentralized networks. So the problem is in medicine, the entire system is set up to be centralized. And when I first started in medicine 30 years ago, it, less than 1% of doctors were employed by hospital systems, you know, where they were employees, just like most people probably listening to this are employees. We were all entrepreneurs. So what's happened in the last 30 years is that hospital systems have actually bought doctors. Now doctors are employees and work for them. So are you getting the doctor's advice or are you getting the employer's advice so that it fits the marketing tag, you know, for right. the market you're in? So for example, today's, you know, current events, you know, which we're talking about the vaccine, uh, many doctors don't. Uh, feel great about the vaccine. They know that there's huge problems um, with the vaccine rollout and the mandates that have been made by the government. But the problem is if they speak up, their bosses are going to do something to them. And you, everybody, I think that's not brain dead, uh, has seen on social media that physicians and nurses have had to make a choice. Yeah. And that choice is, am I going to continue to do this? Or am I going to do this, you know, based on my own values and my own ethics and also my own education and, and make the choice for myself? My position on this is because I'm not anti-vax. What I am is I am anti-freedom. Yeah. I'm anti-choice. Uh, and I just think it's crazy that we can let women have abortions, but we can't let people decide whether they want to put a vaccine. I mean, to me, they're absolutely equivalent. And you have to go through informed consent to have an abortion. Well, you should have to go through informed consent when it comes to a vaccine in your arm as well. And I think it's the job of the physician to actually have a discussion about the pros and cons with the patient so that they know. And I think then and only then can you make a decision. And the point that I want to make to you is that a centralized physician ultimately cannot have a free and clear discussion with the patient about that. Why? Because there's a middleman that's pulling the strings behind. And you have to remember when you're an employee, like for example, many times the pediatrician gets told by the hospital administrator, you have to see 60 patients per day right. in order us for to make money in your clinic. And if you don't do that, we're going to close your clinic. That's actually how medicine is practiced these days. And people don't realize that. Right. And this is the reason why when you're a patient, and you come in to see a doctor and say, just for argument's sake, you want to have a discussion between a vegan diet and a carnivore diet, just for argument's sake. The doctor says, yeah, I can't do that because I have about five and a half minutes to see you. We need to get this done. And why does this fit the way medicine's practiced? Because the easiest way to get rid of a patient is treat them with a prescription pad, hand them a script, and you're in and out. And guess why the system is set up that way? Because the other middleman, which is Big Pharma, is in control of the medical school curriculum. And the medical school curriculum is based on the things and how a central, central system would work. And sometimes central systems are good. I don't want everybody to think that centralization is always bad. For example, when you go buy a TV and you have a problem with it, it's nice to go back in a store and talk to somebody who owns the store and say, look, I've got a problem with the TV. But the problem is, uh, and this is borne out really well in finance, we have central banks. Central banks control our money. They make decisions about our money that we as uh, taxpayers can't control. And when they make that decision unilaterally, uh, you would like to think that it was always good for the taxpayer. But it turns out everybody who's probably going to probably watch this podcast is experiencing the same thing. We're all going through inflation. And inflation is when the central bank decides to print more money. We've done that for the last two years through COVID. But when you print more money, what's the effect? It means that 
the purchasing power of the dollar goes down. So effectively, inflation is like um, an invisible tax that doesn't need any legislative power to go through. Why? A central entity was able to make the decision and everybody has to live with it. Yeah. So when you see it from that perspective, and then you look at kind of what's going on in medicine, you're like, wait a minute, does that mean that I'm getting optimal health? Does that mean I'm getting the best ideas in longevity from my doctor who's uh, is being paid by a central entity? Is this in my best interest to do that? And I, I will tell you that I think COVID has actually done more for me in the last two years because truly 15 years before when I started fo uh, focusing in on mitochondrial medicine versus RNA and DNA medicine, mm. uh, which is what centralized medicine focuses on, mm. um, things change. People then began to realize you know, it's nice to be able to come down and sit down with your doctor for an hour or two at a time. Like, for example, I have a patient here right now. That patient is going to be here for three days. They were here last night. Wow. That's the kind of, of relationship that can be built in a decentralized system. Not only that, you get to know all the ins and outs of that patient and also the different facets of their life that you would never know when you were taking their insurance and, and uh, trying to sit down with them through five exactly. to 10 minute visits. And <laughs> ultimately it's a value judgment that you, the patient has to make with you, the doctor. I just decided, you know, 15 years ago that I saw the problems in the centralized system. I've never wanted to be employed. And I have actively fought against that for a long period of time. But the problem is the system in medicine is completely flipped now. Mm -hmm. And we are in that system. The real problem um, is people like you and people like your listeners, they don't understand what the pitfalls of a centralized system are. And the reason I have been happy is COVID has actually brought most of them out. It's like obvious now to people mm -hmm. that, hey, this is a problem. You know, I've got a big issue with this. Why, why should my job tell me what to do with my body? Right. What, what, and, you know, and I'll take it even a step further. Uh, why should my president tell me what to do? Remember, an executive uh, order is, it's a mandate. It's not a law. Anybody who went to third, fifth, or seventh grade in the United States knows that it takes Congress to pass a bill, and it's got to go to the president to be signed. So effectively, what is an executive order? Because for the last 50 years, what presidents have done is they've tried to legislate through executive orders. Why? Because it's an easier process. They don't have to get it through. They're hoping that you're an obedient idiot, that you'll listen. Effectively, if you look and talk to a lawyer about this, a legal, I should say an executive order mandate has the same legal power as propaganda from a newspaper. Wow. And when you understand that, then the goal is do not comply. See, compliance is the diet that authoritarians feed off of. Yep. And the big issue is it hasn't been really bad in the United States sans probably the Patriot Act, which manifest from 2001 from the towers coming down. But now it's gotten exponentially worse because now all of these ideas are all tied to some of the things that are linked to the Patriot Act. For example, I tell people that COVID is a compliance test to get to an economic reset. The reason for that, people seem to be unaware that um, we have this huge problem right now globally, not just the United States. We're, everybody's in debt up to their eyeballs. So everybody's trying to figure out how are the government's gonna do this? Well, their plan to do it is, and they have a plan, they're giving the control to the central bankers. The central bankers are making the determination right now. So I'll give you an example. Most people who probably listen to your podcast lived through the financial crisis in 2008 to 2010. That's where we bailed out the banks. Too big to fail. We got two different groups from that. We got Occupy Wall Street. We got Black Lives Matters. And then we also got Bitcoin. And depending ideologically where you go is where you fall in to those plans. Here's the interesting part of the story. 
COVID is now a bailout for big pharma. The people who are making tons of money are big pharma in this. And what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to replace, to destroy the U.S. economy, but replace the U.S. Constitution, which gives all of us our rights with the U.N. Charter. And it turns out if you read the U.N. Charter, the U.N. Charter basically gives governments control over our rights. See, that's the big difference. That's ultimately where this is going. And why is it going that way? It's because right now, the Federal Reserve believes they have to have total control in order to fix this problem at the end of a debt cycle. See, the last debt cycle that everybody learned about was Hitler and World War II. This debt cycle is a totally new ballgame. Is it likely going to end the same way? Probably not. Could it be tied to a war? Yeah, uh, it probably would be a war with China and the South China Sea. But the big, real big issue is right now your government is at war with you. And the reason why is how they're looking to pay off this that cycle is they want to use your money in the bank to do it. And they're doing it two ways. They're creating inflation in your money. So what does inflation do? Knocks the pricing power down of your dollar. But here's the big, the big second one that nobody realizes is going on. Real interest rates in the bank. Like when you go put money in the bank, it's negative. So if you put $100,000 in, the bank turns around and says, we're guaranteed you have 98000 when you take it out. They're like, wait a minute. I'm supposed to put money in the bank and get more money back. Why would this happen? And see, what's happening, that keeps the bankers solvent so they continue on until they can do what they want to do to control us. And the reason why they have to do this is they have to get control of our finances to make sure that they're able to pay some of the debts that they helped create. This is the problem. And this is what people don't realize is going on. So COVID is a shell game. It's a shell game to keep you thinking, hey, this is a real big problem on the biologic side. Let's keep your focus here. But this is really what's going on. And the problem is they've got us separated out on ideological lines, you know, right and left, so that they can divide and conquer. So half the population believes everything that Dr. Fauci says is true. And they also believe that Jerome Powell and the Fed is true. Then there's the other half of the population that believes they're both full of shit. And the problem is this from a 30,000 or 40,000 foot view is a real problem for a lot of people, especially when you talk about health, because I try to explain to people uh, how I made my ideologic change a long time ago was I realized in centralized medicine that we were looking at the wrong problem. And I believe the same thing is true in finances right now, that when we look at the banking system, what we've all ascribed to it's also looking at the wrong problem. And the real issue is that we put a middleman in the game. We don't need a middleman in the game. So I tell all my people that follow mitochondrial medicine, which focuses on your mitochondrial DNA, that you have a doctor in your body, okay? The problem is you need to trust that doctor in your body. You need to understand how mitochondria work to transform energy and information from your environment to what you're choosing. If you do that, you just need guidance on your path to doing it. The real problem right now for modern humans is they've gone away from nature and more to technology. Why? Because technology brings us inside. I mean, look at both of us. We're both inside. This is unusual for me because I'm usually outside. But as I told you today, it's a working day for me. So I'm inside talking to you, but I'm constantly trying to get people outside in nature so that they can they can be in that decentralized network that operates with your mitochondria mm. so that it's optimized for energy and information transfer in your body. If you do that, then there's a less of a need for you to have some of the expensive treatments that most people accept in the centralized marketplace. And until you understand that, you're not going to make those changes. That's the reason why I tell people that choices are the hinges of your destiny. If you choose to live your life in an indoor existence, you will need centralized doctors to wallet box you until you're dead. And you will continue to get big pharma solutions and different types of surgery and things like that that harm you. What doctors are really good at, and I would say both decentralized physicians and centralized ones, we're really good at taking care of acute trauma. So you break your leg, you break your arm, 
you get a subdural hematoma, that both doctors are really good at. But it turns out if you're paying attention, the real problem in medicine right now is the chronic disease epidemics. Mm -hmm. Those aren't acute problems, they're chronic diseases. And chronic diseases aren't gonna be solved by a centralized system. The reason why is because big pharma and hospitals have built a sick care system, meaning they can make huge amounts of money the sick you get. So it's incumbent upon you, the patient or the customer, to realize what game is being played here. And once you realize what the game is, then you get to opt out by doing things differently than they tell you to do. So I'll give, give you an example of this. You go to the dermatologist, they tell you to stay out of the sun. That's it, across the board. They don't explain yep. themselves. They just tell you that. Go buy you know, SPF 45. Oh, God. But they never sit down and tell you, well, what does that mean for my vitamin D level in my body? And what does it mean for cell-mediated and innate immunity? Those things never get discussed. Well, we can take a pill and a pill replaces the sun. Well, it turns out Mother Nature says that's not true, okay? And there are consequences for that decision. And Can you elaborate are, on that real quick? On what? On, on sunlight versus vitamin D supplementation? Yeah, it's pretty simple. I mean, the way sunlight works in your skin, you're designed to take a cholesterol ester in your skin, gets 312 to 320 nanometer light, converts uh, a single double bond into vitamin D. So vitamin D is made from a cholesterol ester. That is uh, called 25 dihydroxy vitamin D. It takes water from your mitochondria to convert that. It's called the photoisomerization step. So this is all quantum biology. In other words, it's not straight biochemistry. It needs light to work. Mm -hmm. So when you take the pill, uh, let me finish the other story first. 25 dihydroxy vitamin D has got to go to your liver or kidney, then be converted to the active vitamin D, which is 125. So that means if you have a kidney disease or liver disease, or your mitochondria doesn't make enough water in your skin, you don't make enough 125. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. So when you take a pill, you're generally given either vitamin D2 or D3. What the doctor doesn't tell you is D2 comes from plants. You're not a plant, okay? D3 is the animal source. Uh, the animal source is only that one metabolite of vitamin D. It turns out when the light hits your skin, you make about 990 chemicals in that conversion that all program both innate and cell-mediated immunity in your body. So it's not just one chemical. See, everybody believes that. Mm -hmm. but your body makes up others. So mm -hmm. I tell people when you take vitamin D pills, it's like going to the gym and hiring a trainer and having them do push-ups and thinking you're getting the benefit for it. <laughs> Cause that's wow. not how it works, wow. but see, that's what people do. And they just look at a blood blood work and say, Oh, look, your blood levels are low. We'll hit it with this. And that's it. And they think it's great. And it turns out a lot of physicians who do this, they always come back and remark to me, Jack, why is it? that even when I put them on vitamin D, they're still, they still come back low. And some of them really have a huge problem. I said, because you don't understand that it's the environment that they're living in. See, the problem is that's how every doctor visit should start with a patient. Tell me about your environment. Totally. Yeah. And it doesn't start that way. It always starts <laughs> with your family history and, and things like that. And right. the problem is this is the perspective difference between a centralized medical system and a decentralized medical system. And as I said to you before, vitamin D from the sun uh, created that way is the most efficient way to transfer energy and information from the sun to your mitochondria wirelessly. Mm. That's exactly what it does. Mm. There's a lot of intermediate chemicals that make this process happen, but it's incumbent upon you to know that it's not the same to get it from a pill. Uh, and I'll, I'll take this even a step further because we're talking about a drug here. Since a lot of your people are probably into different diets, I would tell you that if your diet isn't completely controlled by photosynthesis, remember, the entire food web on this planet is linked back to photosynthesis. So yeah. photosynthesis should be thought of like a factory quantita uh, uh, quantitative uh, uh, a QA program that takes care of efficiency and um, quality. Okay. Quality assurance program. The problem is most of the food today is not grown in the sun. It's actually grown in fake light. And it happens to be grown with chemicals that 
mother nature doesn't really use. So <laughs> your question then has to be, is the food that I'm eating right now like nature would build it or like man would build it? So guess what? Now the question you can see in food, is this a, from a centralized system or a decentralized system? And it turns out photosynthesis works again, all on quantum mechanical principles. In other words, the latitude and, and longitude that you are on the planet, the sun has a specific quantum yield for that. So mm. I just gave you a, bunch, a whole bunch of words, word salad. How can I make, make it third grade so you get it? Does a pineapple grow in Boston? No. So that means you have no business eating a pineapple in Boston at any time during the year from the quantum mechanical perspective. Because what does that do? It creates chaos in your body. Chaos, we have a word for it. It's called inflammation. So if you're going to eat something like that, you probably should do it at the height of summer when pineapples tend to grow. So when you eat a pineapple or a coconut, you live in Boston and it's December 31st, you just broke nature's laws, not mine. And when you do that, you pay a biologic toll in your mitochondrial function. In other words, your mitochondria does not make energy as efficiently as it should. So when you come into this world, if you're not born from a bad egg, you kinda, I, I tell people, you think of yourself like a Ferrari engine. If you continue to eat pineapples and coconuts on December 31st, your whole life, you're gonna wind up like a Nissan Sentra blowing black smoke and you're gonna create a huge problem. And then you're gonna go hire people who are gonna tell you to do this, that, and the other thing. and buy my protein powder and buy my bars and do this and do that. Mm -hmm. And guess what's going to happen? Your Nissan Sentra is not going to do anything. In fact, it may even get worse. And then you're going to throw your hands up and go, wait a minute, spending all this good money trying to get all this good information, but what's happening. And again, it goes back to the story that I told you earlier, that information and energy. Okay. They follow very strict thermodynamic principles. And the problem is, that centralized medicine has been pushing these principles out at, for their benefit. And most yeah. people don't understand truly how food works. Food is an electromagnetic barcode of sunlight. And mm. that's what it is. And mm. if you break the rule, you are going to have a problem. And it turns out most of us are breaking those rules now because most of us are living our life far too much inside. And not yeah. when we're designed to eat is actually when the sun's out. When you eat after the sun goes away, you're breaking every rule you can. And that's just one of the easy ones. There's plenty of other ones that we, we break the rules on that people need to know. And when I wrote my book on Amazon, I have a, a, an idea in there called the leptin prescription. The leptin prescription basically tells you that it's not calories in, calories out. It's not how much you exercise. But actually, when you eat is more important than what you eat. Yeah. And yeah. most people 15 years ago, when I said that, thought it was crazy. Yeah. Dr. Panda has some awesome research on that as well. That's been a very interesting topic for me. And I've even just intuitively, like from a, just a basic body composition perspective, I've, it's, I'm like, I've been telling people for years, if you just want to make the game easy, don't eat after like four or five, like just go to bed a little bit hungry. And now we have so much info to back that up. And it's, yeah, I, I can't agree more. And if you, when I do break that, it's not every once in a while, it's a crazy day, or I'm at some event and I'm eating at like nine o'clock at night. I wake up feeling horrible because I just disrupted my body's ability to repair and recover because I was so busy digesting food. But I'll let you, I'll let you expand on that since this is obviously a, a yeah. big, <laughs> big interest for you. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge issue and it's, yeah. it's a problem that manifests over and over again. And most people think that if they just get back on board the next day, they're fine. It turns out that the data shows that it doesn't come back on board right away. You actually throw off a lot of the circadian rhythms in your body. Mm -hmm. And what you need to do is you have to have the light reset, meaning the sun the next morning absolutely has to reset mm. all the damage that you did. So if you don't get up the next morning and see the sunrise, this problem lingers even further. What does that mean? Wow. It means that your clock timing mechanism in your mitochondria is off. And if mm. you continue to make that mistake over and over and over again, guess what happens? You never recapture what you lost. And if it really goes on for decades, that's where a lot of the chronic diseases come in. And you know, the, the thing that's really hard for people to understand 
is, you know, when I talk about childhood diseases, you know, we'll talk about like type one diabetes or kids that are born with cancer. It's not that the kids who, you know, the centralized doctors want you to believe that, oh, these kids have a genetic uh, problem and that's the reason why it happens. No, it's not. It's an epigenetic problem mm. that came from mom's egg and dad's sperm because mm. mom and dad were doing things before they had the baby that set their germs, their germ seeds a certain way so the baby could be born with, say, retinoblastoma or type 1 diabetes. Like I had a conversation today when I was in the MRI scanner with one of my nurses and she's pregnant now and she asked, she asked me, she goes, Dr. Cruz, I've heard you tell people that if they have a, a C-section scar, it's a guarantee that they're blue light toxic. I said, there's no question about it. I said, not only that, ask the mother with the C-section scar if the kid had uh, jaundice and you'll almost always find that it's true. And no OBGYN, mm -hmm. no doctor can ever explain why kids get jaundice. Well, the reason why is because their red blood cells turn over too fast. Guess what controls that? Circadian biology. Mm -hmm. So even a child who's never breathed one breath in their life can come out of the vagina or the belly and have a bad clock mechanism. Wow. So then you've got to realize if kids are being born this way, and what's the ultimate proof that modern humans have a problem with this? Right now, one in two couples are infertile. And guess why? Because the way they're living their life, they're not connected to the decentralized network, which is nature. And they're not being told by their physicians how important this really is. Why? Because if they were to do that, then they wouldn't need the prescription pad and God forbid mm -hmm. if they don't get that. Um, and you have to realize the, the system really is the problem until the system is blown up. And the only way the system is going to get blown up, it's not going to get blown up from the inside. It's going to get blown up from people like you and the people yeah. listening to this. You have to begin to ask better questions to yeah. uncover the, the absolute nonsense you're being told. Like for example, I've done podcasts tremendously in, in Australia. Everybody knows in Australia, they have a huge problem with skin cancer. So every time I go down there and I get challenged by a dermatologist or um, a, another physician on uh, solar exposure being probably the single most important thing to keep it healthy, I turn around and ask them, I said, have you ever actually done a meta-analysis research of the dermatology literature about both melanoma or regular skin cancer? And ask yourself, why is it that everybody has those cancers has low vitamin D levels if the sun's toxic? And they all look at you like they don't have an answer. Yeah. And they don't realize that cancer actually manifests when you have mitochondrial damage and your innate and cell mediated immunity doesn't work. See, normal, normal immune systems are able to knock out these cancer cells. Abnormal immune systems can't. So the disease manifests and it turns out mm -hmm. that normal sensible solar exposure lowers your risk. Like the same thing I just told you about skin cancer is true in women about breast cancer. 2009, the WHO came out with a, a paper and said, single biggest risk fa factor for breast cancer is low vitamin D status. Well, think about it. Do women walk around with their tops down in the sun? No, because cultural and societal issues. But guess what? That is the reason why women are having a huge problem. Same thing is true with cervical cancer. Same thing is true with ovarian cancer. Same thing is true with men with prostate cancer. Hmm. So now, if you begin to accept some of these ideas and you say, okay, how do we fix this? Well, it's simple. How can Tara be naked without being naked and get everything done? Well, you go buy a, a tan through bathing suit yeah. or a workout suit, like a Kaniki or a cool tan. And then you can get that vitamin D there. So when you take your bathing suit off and you see tan lines and this and that, you're not helping yourself. You need to actually do something. So for guys or ladies, I call it junk maintenance. Drop in the top, building someplace where you can do that. If you live at a high latitude, it's even a bigger issue. This is the reason why when we look at breast cancer data, we see women that live further away from the, the equator have, have way more breast cancer. And then this you is go- so uh, this is fascinating. I've never heard this before. So you're saying that it's, it's actually correlated with that area of the body, not getting sun exposure, the cancer yeah. in that particular area. Well, it's not only that part of the body. Remember you make vitamin D from all your skin, right? But the key is, and this is the key. The papers all show 
that ladies that come in with the worst type of breast cancer or any breast cancer always have low vitamin D levels. Hmm. Wow. So if you have low vitamin D levels, do you think the breast is going to be top of the list? No, it's not going to get any sun. Right. But you can tell by how white people are. And this goes to the other point of the story I made to you before, Tara, that people get told information that taking the pill, the vitamin D3, is just like taking you know, mm-hmm. sun. And it turns out it's not. Why? Because vitamin D3 pills only make one of the chemicals. That's active vitamin D. Well, what about the other 990 chemicals that program, meaning, remember I told you energy and information Mm -hmm. the same? Mm -hmm. Information from sun makes those other chemicals that programs your innate and cell media immunity. So if you're getting just one of the chemicals and you don't have the others, can you see why your T and B cells may not work great? And I mean, this is even a bigger deal in our modern, um, I guess, current events with COVID. Why? I told my members two years ago that, vitamin D was going to be the single biggest issue that people would get COVID. And everybody asked me why I said it. It's because when I was in medical school 30 years ago, I was taught that coronaviruses have a seasonal uh, diurnal pattern and they do. But most people don't remember that because they don't read the books. And it turns out that's the reason why people get flu in the wintertime Mm -hmm. because the sun's not strong. Mm-hmm. And it turns out in the, in, the, in, the, in the summertime, you don't get flu because your vitamin D level is higher because your cell and innate immunity is built up. Yeah. So what is nature telling us? <laughs> the best vaccine is sunlight. It's not a jab in your arm, but guess what? Nobody can make money from sunlight. Hence, the reason right. why a centralized system didn't want to explain this to people mm-hmm. when it occurred. Yeah. I mean, the correlation between the, the, uh, the, um, intensity of symptomology or deaths with COVID and vitamin D is like, it, it's unbelievably obvious. I mean, it's just like you, you vitamin D levels go up, but it's the not a, drops. I'm going to tell you though. It's not, uh, I'm going to correct you here. It's okay. not unbelievably obvious. And I'm going to tell you why okay. maybe obvious to you, maybe obvious to the people listening to this, but the greater audience, you need to understand why this happened because it points out one of the problems in a centralized medical system. You know that the vaccines, when they were created, were created under uh, emergency use authorizations called mm-hmm. EAU. Yeah. Do you know what the legal definition for EAU is? No. If there's any other medication out there that works against us, they're illegal. Wow. So do you know why they had to talk about ivermectin, hydrochloroquine, and vitamin D? Because if any of them were shown to work, Wow. Giving somebody an experimental vaccine is considered illegal Ugh. by the law in the United States. So what makes did they me so do? mad? <laughs> they crafted information on the TV and media, social media. And what is that? That was just like propaganda. They got people to believe what they wanted them to believe. Why? Because this was like Palm Sunday. They, they made the road perfect for the, the man-made and not the sun. And what did the, what else did they tell us, Tara? Stay inside. You need to be locked down. Oh, they closed beaches and parks. And literally here in Utah, I drove down to Moab. I thought surely in the middle of nowhere on dirt, I could take my kids camping. Nope. Dirt's closed. You can't go in right. the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And there's, but you have to realize there is a reason for that. And that's why mm-hmm. when I tell you, when you start to see all these things mm-hmm. that have gone on the last two years, especially when you're a physician, you have a duty to speak up. I, right. You learn, this, you learn this lesson from what Gandhi did, uh, what Malcolm X did, and what Martin Luther King did. They said when they were talking about both civil rights and human rights, as well as Vietnam, that if you stay silent, when something bad is going on, you're as bad as the oppressor. 100%. And I'm, and I'm telling you right now that people need to understand why this was going on. They are trying to get um, a goal, a goal done. And this is a big deal. Why? Because they want to maintain their power. And the the entire goal is a one world government. It's what the World Economic Forum and what the WHO do. They are complicit. They have help. Don't don't get me wrong. The helpers in the UK were like Neil Ferguson and his modeling data. And here it was IMHE, which is Gates Foundation. These people are there partners that are helping pull this together? Are there going to be other parts to this problem 
that people need to be worried about. For example, some of your members may know about the Eat Lancet data. The Eat Lancet data is totally tied to the World Economic Forum. Why? They want everybody to eat plants. Why? Because they know when you eat plants, you become an obedient idiot. And <laughs> the big issue there is the World Economic Forum is behind that. They have gained the system by making sure the right scientists are in the right areas. So for example, at Harvard's uh, medical school, Walter Willett has been cooking the books on nutrition trials for literally 30 years. And this is actually part of their plan. Um, wow. The stuff going on right now with you know, shortages through supply chains, the supply chains were broken on purpose. Why? Anytime you break supply chains, what happens? Inflation manifests. What did I tell you before? They need inflation. They don't need it, you know, super duper high like it is in Venezuela, but they need it because they need to devalue your money. That's the reason it's happening. It's all about fixing that problem. And the thing is, the thing that offends me the most is that they're using my profession as their soldiers in this yeah. army against right. the public. And the thing is, you guys look at us and say, you're supposed to be the experts. And what many of you don't know is that when the founding fathers built this country, there was a, a pretty famous physician named Benjamin Rush. He actually signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. What you don't know about, but I'll tell you what you do know about. He's got a medical school named after him in Chicago. But what you don't know is that Benjamin Rush tried to convince um, Thomas Jefferson to put an article in either the Declaration of independence or get it in the constitution about medical tyranny because he wow. felt that this could be used against us. It's very famous. Thomas Jefferson considered it. He even talked to uh, James Madison about it wow. in the state of Virginia, but ultimately decided not to put it in because they thought it was too unlikely that would ever happen. Wow. Okay. 257 years later, look where we're at. Wow. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, going back, I mean, I'm looking at, you know, I'm outspoken about this on social media as well. So I don't think if anybody follows me on social, they'll be surprised by this conversation. I'm sure they very much appreciate it. Um, you know, thinking that looking at how vitamin D is literally banned as a hashtag on Instagram, natural immunity is banned as a hashtag. Um, I just shared a, you know, a little video of a guy but talking. At I want you to understand why though. it's because if it wasn't, and people knew about it, that would inactivate the emergency youth authorization. That issue now is dead. It's dead because now they've got full approval, but wow. I want you to know what the next step is. Yeah. They are trying to bury papers out there now that show that natural immunity is far more durable. Why? Because this breaks the narrative of both efficacy and safety that mm -hmm. will force somebody to do something about it. This is the reason why this medical tyranny is a huge issue. You have people that are working for the government and for big pharma at very high positions, exerting their control. You need to know as a patient, as a taxpayer, that you don't have to comply with this. Once the science is clear to you that natural immunity built by the sun and your immune system, by the things put in you, is better for you and less risky from the side effects that a vaccine is, then it should be incumbent upon you and your physician to make that choice. The problem mm -hmm. is most patients defer to the doctor. Wrong answer. You guys need to step up your game. So yep. you'll always see if you follow me on Twitter, I always put mm -hmm. hashtag do not comply. Yeah. And I always tell people question everything. Right. If it's not built by mother nature, you need to question it. <laughs> well said. Well said. Yeah. And I, man, I, I, I was looking at your website and I was looking at how you have a farm there at your longevity center and bringing people into nature. You're talking about how you spend most of your day outside. And I, this is a huge thing for me too. I'm, I'm constantly um, encouraging people to be outside more. I just, it's so easy. I mean, and like, do you have a, a little patch of something you can just sit on outside some grass, you can take your shoes off for a minute. It's not that hard. And it's, um, you know, as a health coach, this is, you know, I get attacked. I'm sure you get a lot of attacks on social media too. And that's what happens when you're willing to have a backbone and stand for your truth. And one of the things that, you know, um, 
that I, I struggle with is, um, this, like, you need to be listening to the doctors, right? It's like the, the, like that, that there's only one, there's only one voice of all doctors and they're coming through CNN, you know, every single doctor agrees with this. And for me as a, as a health coach, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm helping people optimize their health that have only been to Western medicine doctors and the experience that they're having that I've seen over and over again is that they, you know, let's say that they're going through a divorce, their dad just died. They're going through major trauma. Maybe a child died. Um, they have all these things going on. They're eating like crap candy and soda and all of these things. And what is the, what does their Western medicine doctor do? They put, it puts them on a stimulant or an SSRI. Right. And I used to get frustrated by that, but then I realized they don't know what else to do. They're not educated on nutrition. They're educated. They are highly educated pharmaceutical sales reps, you know? And so I would actually tell you that the thing that you need to, when people tell you, yeah, we need to listen to the doctor. You need to flip it around and say, well, let's look at the return on equity from centralized medicine. We have chronic disease epidemics that they have been impotent to fix. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the certification. Let's talk about yeah. the MD degree. Let, let's talk about yeah. the failure. See, when we have failures in any other businesses in any other industry, we actually come back and we do a post more and say, why is this happening? See, nobody's doing that wow. in medicine. You know right. why? Because the people of Big Pharma are benefiting. Memory, their goal is to create customers, not reverse diseases. Right. Right. And guess what? You get that mindset of as a physician when you believe everything that's in that curriculum, meaning that everything's mm-hmm. about RNA and DNA. And it turns out they never teach you about the third genome in your cells, which is the mitochondrial genome that you only get from your mother. And when you begin to understand that, you go, well, wait a minute, how does this change the game? And this is actually where the story of epigenetics comes in. See, everybody knows the genetic story. Big Pharma decided to abscond and usurp the power by utilizing Watson and Crick and DNA. That was their cover game. Because guess what? When they don't know, you know what they can always say? Oh, well, it's genetic. And it turns out that worked up until about 2003, 2004, until we had studies at Duke University that showed, hey, guess what? The software, the chemicals actually made from a mitochondria sculpt RNA and DNA. So maybe we need to be looking at those things instead of the downstream effects. Yeah. And guess what? That message still to this very day is being fought tooth and nail by the powers that be in the AMA and big pharma. And the problem is until you get control of a medical school curriculum, or until a doctor goes through it and begins to continue to ask questions like how it worked for me was simple. When I was out in practice for a period of time, it's like, why aren't these people getting better from what I was taught to do? And thank you for so- asking that question. I'm so, I just have to interject. It drives me. I'm like, I, I, I don't, I'm like, all right, either you're either just not a deep thinker or you just don't care, but how can you see people coming into your office over and over and over and over and over for decades and not say, I wonder why they have hypothyroidism. I wonder why, you know, like, no, no, I got you. Here's your prescription. You know, like I'm going to tell you the reason why this is, this is gonna, this probably stun you a little bit because you need, you need to hear why this happens. There's a very pretty famous guy named Edward Bernays, 1929. He wrote a book called propaganda. He was a Jewish guy. And he became the father of marketing on Madison Avenue, okay? Mm-hmm. He's, he, his work convinced ladies to start smoking, lucky strikes, that it was good for their health, things like that. And you would normally today in 2021, 20, 20, you'd say as a woman, that's preposterous. But guess what? It was extremely successful. Propaganda and marketing really works. Yeah. Now, let's fast forward a little bit. In 1933, Joseph Goebbels from the Third Reich took Bernays book and said, if you can get people to buy cigarettes and pills like this, what if we decided to use this on a population? Could we retool the way people think wow. about things using propaganda? So guess what? Everybody knows what happened with the Jews and the Germans in World War II at the last death cycle. But here's the, the most instructive thing for you to hear, Tara. At the Nuremberg trials, they asked Goebbels, how did you get good people in Germany to follow along with this. And he said, that was simple. All we had to do is scare them with propaganda. Well, guess what? That's exactly 
what happens in medicine with big pharma. They mm -hmm. scare you with propaganda and say, if you go out in the sun or you get any of these changes, this is going to be a problem. As soon as they get you to do something like that, you already have an altered immune system. In other words, processes in you begin to go bad and they have drugs that fit every single possible disease that's out there. And the problem is they're not, they don't care that you don't get better. Right. See, the real problem isn't the doctors. It's actually big pharma. The doctors mm -hmm. are educated just enough to be an obedient idiot for the pharmaceutical country. The problem is there's a lot of doctors out there that do ask the questions. Yeah. But here's the thing. After you've invested all the money and time as right. a physician, when are you going to go back and say, is everything that I was taught wrong? And then you go, okay, now how am I going to pay my bills <laughs> right. if in fact this is the problem? Yep. And guess what? That's the conundrum. And yep. I tell people that what doctors are going through right now uh, goes even way before Goebbels and Bernays. This one, this, this problem that Bernays tripped over for marketing and Goebbels used for uh, uh, fascism is actually tied to Plato's allegor uh, allegory of the cave. This is thousands of years ago. Plato came up with the idea of a bunch of slaves in a cave with chained to the wall. And over a period of time, they put a shadow cast on the wall and the, and the masters told the slaves, this is what the world is like. And they did that day after day after day. One day, one of the slaves got free, went outside and saw that there was nature outside. There was sun, there was mountains, there was animals. So that slave was faced with an ethical dilemma. Do I go back in and tell everybody else who's locked up or do I just run away? So Plato's allegory to cave said that the slave went back in tried to educate everybody else. And you know what he found? Everybody there was happy with the status quo. Uh, they all had Stockholm syndrome yeah. and he couldn't change it. And I will tell you that 15, well, now it's 17 years ago when I got the message, when I broke free and I went out, I can tell you going back and trying to teach the doctors what the real problem is is a mind numbing experience. Why? Yeah. Because they believe the shadow cast on the wall that right. the masters create. So you know what the key is? The key is to teach you guys who are yeah. the subject right. of the issue. You need to begin to ask the right questions. In other words, you are all going to get some problem at some point where you need a physician. What I'm telling yeah. you is that you need a decentralized physician that looks at mitochondrial health first and foremost before they write a script. And how does, how does somebody find a doctor? I get asked this all the time. I'm like, well, I mean, functional medicine, natural oh, functional, functional medicine is as bad is it? as allopathic medicine. I'm going to tell you the reason why they've taken the same process that all, uh, allopathic medicine has done with prescription pads. They do it with supplements. Hmm, exactly the same thing. Yeah, I can see your point there. The total so, same thing. And you know what the problem is? You'll spend two, three, four thousand dollars right. uh, a quarter on supplements and labs and never get better. Why? Ah, you have a good because point. You're, because you're never looking at the basis. The basis is how is energy transformed through your mitochondria or not? Look, it's simple. In medicine, everybody has learned what do we call a person without energy? A cadaver. You're dead. What do you call somebody who's healthy? Someone who is filled with energy and information. Yeah. So what the key is, the question should always be about the engine, not the fuel coming in. And see, the problem for mm. functional medicine, trainers, the nutrition business, they focus on the fuel and never the engine. Yeah. Think, about, think about this like a Ferrari. It, a Ferrari comes off the line uh, in Italy, right? And it goes 225 miles an hour, no matter if you put corn syrup in it or gasoline. <laughs> But if you put corn syrup in it, it's going to have to go see the mechanic quicker. Yeah. And the mechanic fixes it and it goes back. Yeah. Same thing is true in your body. Your body has a mechanic. It's called the two change programs that control mitochondrial biology, apoptosis and autophagy. Guess what controls that? Quantum mechanical principles. And when you begin to realize this, you go, wait a minute. I need to start learning more about this than I need to learn about carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Why? Because guess what the input to a mitochondria is called? 
electron chain transport. Notice it's not called carbohydrate. It's not yeah. called lipid. Yeah. But everybody keeps talking about macronutrients. When you're talking about macronutrients, that's like talking about the 84th floor on the World Trade Center and not the foundation problem, mm -hmm. which is the engine that feeds it. And what's the output of mitochondria? It's protons. It spins. 3.4 protons make one ATP. Everybody knows about ATP, but everybody forgets it's a proton that does it. Well, you need to ask yourself a question, though. How much do I know about electrons and how much do I know about protons? And when you get to that level, you start going, maybe this is the reason why my patients aren't getting better. Maybe mm -hmm. I don't really understand how the engine works to transform energy properly. And when I do, let me see if it makes a difference. And it turns out it does. And it makes a huge difference to patients. And to see a patient be able to take a disease that is considered incurable. Um, I'll tell you this story, not to digress, but it's a cool story because it happened, yeah, by, mistake, happened mm. by mistake in my clinic uh, in the last two months. So I have a guy that cuts my grass at my longevity center. And he's an older guy and he had um, a knee replacement in the past. And he also was diagnosed with uh, acute macular degeneration. And he's an ex-Marine, so he's a pretty hardy guy. He uh, went on my roof of my clinic to clean out the gutters, which I don't know why he did. This is just something he decided to do. He fell off the roof, mm. broke his leg, uh, and I was worried about it. Um, mm. So he had the knee replacement in, and the, the, the plate mm. that was in there fractured the tibia straight down the middle because the mm. plate that was in there acted like a wedge. Oh, no. So the orthopedic surgeon told him, look, we're going to have to immobilize you. You're probably going to need to wait till the bone heals. Then we're going to need to go in and fix your knee and then fix the bone and all that. Mm -hmm. So he did, he listened to the doc. Uh, he was having huge problems because they put him on uh, strong narcotics because of the pain. So he calls me up He goes, Jack, is there anything else that you can do for me? I said, Dave, I got a really good idea. I said, why don't you just come over to the clinic every day? You got the keys. And I want you to sit in front of my monster red light that I use for ex-professional athletes. And he goes, why will that work? I said, well, the red light actually increases ATP production in your mitochondria. So bare minimum, it should actually get rid of your pain. So that way you're not goofy from the pain medicine and you probably won't need it. So literally within two days of treatment, he stopped taking all of his narcotics and he sat buck ass naked in front of this light. Now, you have to see this light. This light's eight foot. Wow. By four, by four feet wide. Cool. So he sits in front of it. And I told him when he sat in front of it, he needed to wear protective goggles. He's a Marine. He didn't listen to me. Mm. Four weeks later, he goes back to the orthopedic surgeon. They do x-rays on him. They're like, your fracture is completely gone. Wow. It, it looks like it's healed. And he's like, doc, I want to show you something else. He takes off the brace and he goes, I can walk. <laughs> and the, the orthopedic surgeon looks at him. He goes, you got to be kidding me. So anyway, he winds up not having to have surgery on his leg. Wow. He's getting around really good. He's not having any pain. About five weeks later, he makes an appointment to go see his retina specialist. He has a eye test done. He's got 20-20 vision. And the retina specialist tells him, I don't see any evidence of the hole in your retina anymore. It looks like wow. your pain is gone. So just so you know, in my world of medicine, allopathic medicine, we're taught that AMD is untreatable okay yeah and i can tell you that i don't i no longer believe that i believe that there's other answers out there and the crazy thing is i knew that i could help this patient minimize his risk of all the complications from big pharmaceutical narcotics with the use of the red light but guess what we found a couple of other tricks that had actually improved bone healing in an 80 year old guy which is shocking. Most doctors who are going to listen to this are going to know bones don't heal that great in older people. That's the reason why they generally have to have surgery. Uh, well, this guy didn't. Uh, and the crazy thing is, if you would have told me that through a couple of things that I had him do, and this red light that we could fix his retina that fast, I would have told you that was pseudoscientific and probably snake oil salesman. Mm -hmm. Now I'm looking into the data behind this and it turns out 
there's a lot of data in the ophthalmology literature around the use of photobiomodulation that even I didn't know about. Wow. And it turns out, do people need to know about this? Yeah, because guess what we did? This, the reason I wanted to highlight this story for you is because I think it makes the case of what's the difference between a decentralized medicine practitioner and a centralized one. See, the centralized one would have kept you on the narcotics, would not give you any other option to get off of it. And then you would have never tripped over into, hey, my bone's healing faster. And you certainly would have never figured out that the red light really helped. And it turns out because he was an ex-Marine, he didn't listen to me. He never wore the protective glasses. Mm -hmm. That's something that I found out later. Mm -hmm. And before admonishing him, when he told me what the retina special did and he showed me the picture of his retinas, I was like, holy smokes, I need to look into this more. And it turned out many of the beliefs that I had in and around the use of red light, especially around the eyes, I'm like, maybe we can use a lot more of this than even I thought. Yeah. Uh, and maybe we can help people with cataracts. Maybe we can help people with narrow angle glaucoma. So you're you know, allowed to explore. <laughs> right. Well, you, you are. And, you know, the real reason why this is a cool story, people are going to say, hey, what's photobiomodulation? What's red light therapy? Well, here's the big thing. Your sun outside, meaning that the, the ball of gas in the sky is 43% infrared A light. It's red light. Most people don't realize that. So the most healing part of the sun is the red spectrum of the sun. This light that I happen to do just takes that part of the solar spectrum out and we use it. So what I began to realize about Dave is that he needed way more sunlight than he was getting. And that light gave him that opportunity when he sat in front of it for four or five weeks. And he was just here yesterday, sitting in front of it for 20 or 30 minutes, just because he feels better when he does it. Yeah. He tells me all the time, all his arthritis pain feels better and things like that. I'm like, dude, you're allowed to do it. You can come in anytime you want. Wow. That's, that is the most compelling story of red light therapy that I have ever heard. So thank you for sharing that. Um, wow. Thank you so much for, um, I think your, your, your voice is so needed right now because of the path that you have taken in life. It, it hits on both of the big hitters of what's happening and in, uh, in, in regards to our freedom, our medical freedom right now. And that's your, your path in medicine and also your path in the financial world. And it's like just completely merged together. And I'm so grateful that you're willing to just take a stand and, and speak your truth and share boldly what you see is going on, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's sad to me that, um, people will want to hush other people. And I hope anybody who listens to this episode, if you don't personally agree in your paradigm right now with what you've heard, like I, I, I wouldn't suggest this if I don't do it, I will go on the mainstream things and I will read everything they have to say. And I'm like, okay, let me look into it. Let me crack my belief system open. And did they said, okay, they said actually not your immunity isn't as good. Let me take a look. Let me just put my guard down and just read the freaking study. Let me read the details. But every single time I have, I haven't found anything that leads me to stay in that way. And so I, all I'm asking, I guess, is for my listeners to just keep an open mind, you know, from, from my opinion, yes, I will say like, I feel like you are are wide open. Like you are, you're awake. You are very aware of exactly what's happening in the world right now. And so I, I just appreciate you sharing that with us and, um, guys, well, if you I want tell to people it's the mark of an educated mind to take something you fundamentally don't believe, examine it for yourself, then make an informed decision. If, right. you, do, if you, if you travel through life like that, you're going to miss a lot of problems and you're going to gain a lot of wisdom. And yeah. You need to keep an open mind about different things. It's okay if yeah. you still think that treating things the way I was taught to treat them um, in my medical training, some of those things still work, but they don't yeah. work for certain disease states or problems that patients right. have. Right. You need to be amenable to that. And yeah. ultimately, um, people are always going to have choices to, to do what they want to do. Right. Know that there's other choices out there. Yeah. Know that there's there's another brand of medicine out there called mitochondrial medicine mm. that's relatively new. Uh, it's focused in on a total different genome in your body, one that very few people have ever even heard of. It works very differently. It only has 37 genes, 13 of which create every bit of energy in your body. And you need to know about those 13 genes and how they work. And how they work with light, 
how they work with electrons, protons, and water. I didn't get into mm. the deep weeds about, you know, the quantum mechanical stuff, because I don't think that's a big deal for you to hear right now, but just know that there's other things out there yeah. for you maybe to look at. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to be nerding out on all of your, <laughs> all of your teachings here. Um, guys, if you want to find Dr. Cruz, his website is Jack Cruz, um, K R U S E. Am I saying it right? Is it Cruz or yeah. Cruz? Cruz. Okay. Cruz. Yeah. Okay. Dot com. <laughs> and then, um, also, um, check out his, uh, longevity center that's cruise at Destin D E S T I N dot com. Yeah. Really cool. You've got a farm out there. If you guys are watching on YouTube, are you at the longevity center right yeah, now? Or, am, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. So, um, yeah, Dr. Cruz, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us today. Hey, no problem. Anytime.